name is Edmundo Rodriguez, and I was named after my father, uh, who was named after a doctor who saved his life when he was uh, being born. So uh, the Edmundo part ends with me uh, because none of my children ended up with my name. Edmundo is a very unusual name. Uh, it's not uh, often found. You will find other versions of. Raimundo, you know, and others like that, but uh, Edmundo is a little bit old school. I've always been Edmundo since birth, and uh, when we uh, came to the United States undocumented, uh, I was uh, 11 years old. I remember um, when they were enrolling me in school, the, uh, the school clerk um, could not pronounce my name. And so she told me that it was the American tradition to select an American name. And uh, I didn't know what to select, and so she instantly gave me the name Edmund. And uh, from that point on, I became Edmund. And uh, the, what I found out later was that she was French-Canadian, and she spelled it with an O. It's E-D-M-O-N-D, which is a French version of Edmund, which is the English version would be E-D-M-U-N-D, Edmund. And so I went all through school as Edmund um, until I got to college. And then I came to realize my Chicano connection and uh, went back to it. Okay, so we'll talk to you about that um, consciousness raising when you get to college. But the second question I always ask is, uh, and I don't want you to tell me the specific date, could you tell us what year and where you were born? I was born in 1948. Uh, and I was born in a jungle uh, in the Yucatan area. Uh, the specific name of the little town was Mutul, M-O-T-U-L. And um, my father was an elected official who was down there doing some work. And my mother was pregnant with me, was in Mexico City, and she was very impatient about my dad not being around. So she went down to the Yucatan area to be with him and she was um, bitten by a scorpion um, foot. And um, they induced labor in order to prevent me from having any serious consequences to that. And so I was born in a hut. Um, I have a painting of the hut. Um, I didn't, I only stayed there 40 days. Uh, it was, I guess, a tradition that a child is not out of the house uh, after 40, or only after 40 days. And so uh, I went back to Mexico City uh, at the 41st day and uh, lived the rest of my childhood there until I was 11. My life at 11 was uh, a very, I think it was very interesting and it was very secretive because we came here undocumented. And uh, again, my mother's impatience um, led us to the United States because uh, my father, something happened the world of politics in Mexico, and my father uh, came here with a diplomatic passport, but we didn't. And so, after being hiding for, I don't really know how long when we were in Mexico, but I know we were kept in an apartment, we couldn't go out uh, for what seemed like a very long time to me, but it could have been just a month or two. Um, we suddenly got picked up and we were driven to Tijuana where we were um, supposed to cross. Uh, we ended up living in Tijuana for about a year because I knew I wanted to go to school there and uh, they wouldn't let me in because we didn't start the school year on time or something like that. And again, my mother was impatient because my dad was here. So at that time, back in the 50s, uh, my, you were allowed, families were allowed to cross the board to go to the laundromat. And so, my mom grabbed, um, uh, I remember, a pillowcase filled up with clothes, and uh, she told us we were going to wash. So my two sisters and myself and she, um, we went to the laundromat, she put the clothes in the washer, put some money in it, and then she grabbed us by the hand and um, walked another block to the uh, bus depot, the Greyhound, and we boarded a bus. and. We were just coming and we kept saying, where are we going? And she says, just, you'll be fine. So we were going, but my mother never realized that there was a, um, 
immigration checkpoint in San Onofre. And uh, so all of a sudden when she sees the blinking lights, uh, she quickly tells us to pretend we're asleep. And so we all just sort of leaned over. We were all on one bench. And we were just like this. And then the immigration officer came onto the bus and started going seat by seat asking for documents. And when he got to our bench, I I remember um, I remember I remember the silence that he had, and he looked at us, and then he just went on to the next bench and just continued the rest of the, the <laughs> checking, and we made it through, and we ended up at the bus depot downtown Los Angeles, where my mother calls my dad, and he's shocked that we are here, and uh, that's how it started. Once we got here, I remember my father uh, picked us up at the depot and he said, you know, I only live in a, a one-room apartment. Uh, he says, but let's go find an apartment. So we got in a car and we drove, um, I remember we were like somewhere downtown Los Angeles and he, he goes into a Shell gas station and he asks the, the attendant if he knew a place where it was safe to raise children without the fear of gangs. And I didn't know what a gang was. Uh, I thought a gang was like West End Story kind of thing, you know, where they performed and things like that. And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? I, I kind of like that because I come from a very bohemian family. And so uh, uh, the man told us, he said, this street, which was Venice Boulevard, says take it all the way west until you hit the sand and then look for a place there. So my father followed that instruction and we ended up at the beach. and. Uh, we, I remember getting up, looking around. It wasn't too bad. I mean, the beach was beautiful. Um, <laughs> and we found a little apartment. So I, I grew up in Venice. Wow. Uh, and I went to the local public school there. My mother and my father, I have no idea how they ever married. <laughs> because completely opposites. Uh, my mother, uh, very uh, indigenous. Uh, didn't go beyond the second grade. Uh, her mother died at birth when she was born. And uh, she grew up, um, she was raised by her older brother who was a, uh, worked on an oil rig in uh, Veracruz. And so they assumed my mother was gonna be an old maid because she was there to take care of her nieces and nephews. And uh, she chose not to, she, she asked to uh, open a store and so my uncle opened a little store for her. Now switching that back to my father. My father comes from a very bohemian family. My grandmother uh, was a, a poet. She was a dress designer. She was a writer. Uh, what my, was her name? Her name is Dolores Suarez, uh, Viuda de Rodriguez, because she was a widower. She was also the very first divorcee in the state of Campeche. Uh, officially divorced, and she paid the price for announcing it. To, to How did she pay the price? Um, she was actually, and she would tell us the story that once she came out of the police department, wherever it was that she got divorced, people started throwing um, things at her because at that time a divorced woman was a prostitute. And my my grandmother didn't look really Mexican. She she uh, looked a little bit Polish, in my opinion. And they didn't think she spoke Spanish, and then she would cuss at them in Spanish, I remember. And, uh, and then she, she was married to a military guy. My, my real grandfather was a military something. Uh, during the Mexican Revolution, my grandmother supported Villa. So you can see politically they were already at odds, and he would beat her. And as a result of her involvement with, uh, with the rebels. And so my grandmother divorced him, and she ended up getting together with a violinist who played for the Mexican Symphony. And he's who I consider my grandfather because he's the one I grew up with. What and is his name? His name is Pablo Ponde de Alcalá. And uh, was his name. Um, and he was a wonderful man. He was a very artistic and so was she. And, uh, they lived in a very interesting place. Uh, my grandmother was very good friends with Frida Kahlo at the time. And she lived in Colonia Roma. And 
it was a very big apartment and it had like four or five bedrooms where my uh, cousins lived. And next to the kitchen was the maid's quarters. And I never understood why my grandfather lived in the maid's quarters because he didn't sleep with my grandmother. And it was out of respect for the children that they would not sleep in the same bedroom. Um, and so it was really interesting because while everyone knew that he was my grandfather and they just had this strange living situation. And um, so my, my dad's side of the family, they're all dancers, visual artists, actors, um, that kind of group. Very, very, very bohemian. I mean, I, I remember when they would hang out in the living room and uh, I didn't know her name was Frida Kahlo at the time. She was just this weird looking lady they used to hang out. Um, and she, they would always talk about communist um, uh, things, which I didn't know anything about. And my father was very pro-communist. Um, he was a strong supporter of Fidel Castro. You know, and I had a, a difficult time because when I was going to high school, I was being trained and taught capitalism and communists were bad in the 60s and my father was saying the opposite and uh, I would never ask my dad for help on a school report <laughs> because it would be totally the wrong thing to do. When they would hang out in the house they would constantly drink and I remember it was uh, cognac that they would drink. And then they would also smoke, not cigarettes, not cigars. They would smoke and somehow um, I was the, the lighter of the cigarettes in the kitchen um, stove. And I was about seven or eight. And of course my mother, who's totally opposite that, strict Catholic, very like straight, solid, and she would tell my grandmother, why are you doing this? And he would, oh, it's not a big problem, sweetheart. <laughs> and because my father was here, and we were there, my my grandmother had basically control of the family, right? My mother, you know, there's a hierarchy. You know. um, now, how my mother and father met, my father, in addition to being in politics, he was a boxer, a professional boxer. And so, he, in one of his fights, it happened to be in the city where my mother was, had her store, and he stopped in to buy something. And he, the story goes that she was, she had climbed a ladder to get something, on the shelf, and he saw her legs and fell in love with her legs, okay? So, they got married, and, but it couldn't have been the most oddest couple, uh, because they just, and my mother was a very wonderful woman, but very, like, she knew what she wanted, but very Indian, if I can use that term to, to use that as a power, uh, a, a real, Margot Albert, who we'll talk about later, when she met my mother, I remember she goes, Ay, que torre de poder es esta mujer. Meaning, what a tower of power this woman has. Because she just knew what she wanted, she knew how to get it without making a fuss. Well, my dad made a fuss about everything, okay? My mother was, was not my mother. Describe what Los Angeles was like when you first saw it. Heaven. I remember uh, seeing the freeway so clean and so smooth and so orderly. Uh, Latin American traffic, if you've traveled down there, you know what it's like. Uh, it was quiet and we were zooming and I kept saying, oh, no wonder I've always wanted to come here. Um, I remember well that the only Mexican place to, to uh, buy Mexican products was Olvera Street. And we lived in Venice. And there were no Mexican stores or anything Latino out there. So, like every couple of weeks, we would make a trek down to Overa Street to buy black beans or pinto beans or things that my mother would cook. Um, I remember also the Herald Examiner, which was a newspaper that existed at that time, along with the LA Times. But the Herald would be on the corner of the street with a can, and people would drop their coins and pick up their newspaper. And I kept saying, oh my God, this is like real heaven. Uh, of course, you can't do that now, but uh, back in the 50s. Total honor system. Everything was the honor system, the golden rule. Kind of like a make-believe society. Now that I look back, I can see why they changed my name. It was the acculturation process. They, they wanted to acculturate all foreigners to be American. 
and American was whatever some people thought American should be. And I know you guys are too young to remember, but there's a Donna Reed show. These television shows that came up at that time were perfect families, and we all wanted that. I remember my mother, when she cooked, she would sweat, and her hair was messy, and she was just wearing a regular dress, and I would often ask myself, why doesn't my mother dress with pearls around her neck? How come she doesn't have a big bow in the back of her head? Kind of like the images I would see on television, like Leave it to Beaver and that kind of a thing. Okay, I went to, I went to school um, for just a few months in Tijuana because I insisted on going to school and they didn't let me. So then I would just sneak into school. I just wanted to be in school. So I got, the, I think I had two months of schooling in, 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 in Mexico, in Tijuana. And I remember the uniforms, and we went to a very poor school, and it was all dirt. The outside was dirt, and but the uniform was white shoes, white socks, white pants, white shirt, white gloves. It never made sense to me because the moment you walked out of that campus, you were kind of messy. But I did it, and, and that was one way I snuck in because I would wear what everybody else would wear. And I remember um, I took a couple of tests that I kept until just, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago I threw them away. I remember how difficult, like, I must have been like the first, second grade, something like that, how difficult those questions were. They would talk about, if you're traveling east, da 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 da, and you want to go west, blah, 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 you know, that kind of a question for that level. And I was really surprised. So what I remember is a little bit of a very um, kind of demanding academic program. Um, but it was not fun. There was no fun to school. It was strictly like 